<clears throat> back for another episode. So today, um, I thought I would just go over breast cancer reconstruction with and without implants, with and without uh, your own tissue, fat transfers, flat closures. There is um, a variety of ways to do breast reconstruction. And yesterday I was actually joking about I'm old enough to have uh, done all the surgeries before uh, we had some of the more uh, uh, from from a tech standpoint before we had some of the uh, very cool things that we do uh, now routinely so when I started general surgery training we did all gallbladder surgery open which means we made an incision underneath uh, the rib cage on the right to go down and get the gallbladder and by the by the time I ended our training uh, I trained in general surgery from 1996 to 2002. It was completely taboo, basically, to do an open gallbladder. And all that transpired while I was in training. So, other things that uh, happened while I was in training certainly were the uh, coming to fruition of doing... Uh, instead of modified radical mastectomy uh, for breast cancer with um, axillary lymph node dissection, which was the standard of care when I started training, to a lumpectomy and a sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by radiation therapy. And so all of those things happened while I was in training. So I was trained by a group of surgeons who transitioned from all open surgery, like I just described, to doing more minimally invasive surgery and trying to teach, you know, the, the students, the residents, and the fellows, all those techniques, all kind of on the fly because they were all happening. So many of us um, who were being trained, um, it, was, it was definitely an interesting time. So as, as it pertains to um, like open surgery, I, I just remember I had a, a mentor he really did not like doing uh, laparoscopic surgery. So he would almost, uh, and out of, out of respect for him, he was just not comfortable doing it. So in that transition time, we did a lot more open cases for him, which means we made the bigger incision and did it in the traditional way. So that was, that's what he was most comfortable uh, doing. So as it pertains to uh, breast surgery, uh, when I started, we offered, uh, like I said, modified radical mastectomies and axillary dissections and transitioned to lumpectomy and sentinel lymph node biopsy. And certainly we still did uh, mastectomies um, and then uh, the plastic surgery team would do reconstruction. So I would see what the plastic surgeons would do um, and I hadn't decided I wanted to go into plastic surgery. I had initially wanted to do a pediatric heart surgery. But about two and a half, three years into it, I adjusted that. I really got interested in microsurgery. So microsurgery is taking basically suture finer than your hair and sewing together blood vessels that are about two millimeters in diameter. So think of like putting together coffee stirrers to reestablish blood flow. And so you can take what's called a composite of tissue or a flap. It could be skin and fat connected to the blood vessels. It could be skin fat fascia, which is a, a thin layer of connective tissue. It can include muscle, it can include bone. It can just be skin and fascia and bone. There's all sorts of ways to do it based on what you're trying to uh, reconstruct. And so I became extremely interested in that in my laboratory year, uh, doing vascular research. And so I transitioned um, to my interest in focus being on going into plastic surgery and doing uh, microvascular surgery. So I completed the six years of surgery training and started plastic surgery training and did, uh, we were the, Center for uh, 
burn care in the state of Indiana, so we took care of all the burn patients, both pediatric and adults. We did oncology reconstruction for breast cancer and had neck cancer predominantly. And then uh, certainly all sorts of other infections and trauma and things of that nature. And then when I, I transitioned into my first teaching job, I was very focused on microvascular breast reconstruction. And there had been a traditional technique called a tram flap. And um, that was where you left the lower tissue of the tummy. The, like if somebody has a little uh, belly, the tissue below the level of the belly button. That would be used but left in, in continuity with one of the six pack muscles. And it would be rotated either to the same side or to the opposite side to help reconstruct the breast after mastectomy. The other technique that was common was called the latissimus dorsi flap. And I did both of those in training and those were your, your tissue reconstruction options really in training. And then everybody was taught in training how to do an expander and uh, implant-based reconstruction because those are just basic techniques. And then when I went into my first teaching job, I really expanded that by taking trips to uh, Europe and Africa to learn how to do, and Asia, to learn how to do more complex uh, microsurgery uh, called perforator flap surgery, which was being done in the United States uh, by Bob Allen, predominantly, and then in Europe uh, by Dr. Philip Blondiel and others, uh, Fu Chin Wei in Taiwan. So anyway, <clears throat> I wanted to learn those advanced uh, perforator flap techniques, and I started a fellowship where I taught at to just do those techniques for both breast reconstruction and head and neck reconstruction, um, predominantly. And then I did a lot of lower extremity reconstruction for sarcomas. But the going, you know, forward for breasts, so we did a lot of the newer technique for breast reconstruction, which in 2005, basically when I started teaching, was called a DIEP free flap. So that's just one type of reconstruction. The types of reconstructions are, you know, first and foremost, an aesthetic flat closure, which is a form of reconstruction. It's just that person has chosen not to have any other tissue placed or any other materials placed, and you perform an aesthetic flat closure. If you want to then add, uh, after discussion, a patient wants to do an expander implant-based reconstruction, you start with a tissue expander at the time of mastectomy, and that's placed normally in the United States behind the muscle. Um, and then when I was uh, starting out in 0506 biomaterials or acellular dermal matrix, something called Alliderm, was kind of coming into the fold and that became a substance that we used a lot to help reinforce the lower third of the reconstruction. So that was incorporated. Acellular dermal matrix is uh, cadaver dermis that's had all the cells removed in a proprietary process. And so that was a very common technique, that two stage. And then I even back in, I think it was 06, 07, was doing one stage uh, technique to help in more um, patients who couldn't tolerate longer operations or needed a single operation, people who in particular one uh, had diabetes and was on dialysis. I remember taking care of where we just wrapped the whole permanent implant in alloderm and placed it. And that became a, a more common technique that's practiced now. And I was doing that in 06, 07. And then um, all the different forms of autologous reconstruction that were what I described perforator flap based, we practiced. And those became higher on the list to perform rather than those traditional techniques that I was taught. So I would rarely do a uh, latissimus flap or I would rarely do a tram flap. Uh, 
where I would rarely do um, uh, any kind of rotational flap surgery. So it was really the DIP free flap was the predominant thing. And then I would do gap flaps and then we would do uh, uh, flaps either from the, the tug, flag, tug uh, flaps from the inner thigh. Those were the predominant ones uh, that we would do. And so I think, you know, what everybody should understand is when someone gets a mastectomy, especially bilateral mastectomies, those are different operations per side. Usually the cancer is not on both sides, and one side will have a more um, aggressive or intense surgery, taking more tissue on the cancer side. That's pretty normal. Um, they'll always be sampling uh, lymph nodes, and uh, that helps you know set forth how they're going to therapeutically take care of the patient afterwards. Is the patient going to get chemotherapy? Is the patient going to get radiation therapy? And it used to be that when people had mastectomies, they didn't get any radiation therapy. And then that changed while I was in training. They started adding post-mastectomy radiation therapy, which really complicated reconstructive cases at times because <clears throat> you didn't know who was going to get that therapy. So you had to have a plan of action to take care of that. And so we'll say in the best case scenario, we did a reconstruction. And I did a free flap based reconstruction, DIP free flap, which is my normal. I tried to do bilaterals um, to help the patient because that technique can only be done one time. Using the tummy tissue can only be done once. So if that patient was gonna have a bilateral or they had decided to have a bilateral mastectomy, we would perform that technique after explaining you know, the risk and benefits of that procedure. We had a 95% success rate uh, connecting those blood vessels and getting all the tissues to perfuse and heal because it's your own material that will never be rejected. It just has to heal and have uh, good blood flow. We used to use um, uh, CT scans uh, with contrast to help us uh, identify which were the best blood vessels to help uh, perfuse those flaps. So we would do those predominantly, get those done, we started using Expro, Expro, which was a long-acting local anesthetic back in 05 to help those patients have less pain. And, you know, now it's, you know, very commonplace uh, in 2024 to use Expro in a combination with other uh, blocks to really help reduce patients' post-operative discomfort. <clears throat> Get them up earlier, really avoid all the kind of complications that come with sitting around with uh, blood clots and just uh, lack of expansion of the lungs and all the things that from sitting or being uh, not moving really. So we would do those cases and uh, patients stay three or four days in the hospital, go home, see them out a week and a month, and three months. And that was my, my protocol. And then, you know, that three month window, you get a sense of how things are settling out. And then you may not see them for quite a while after that because many of them had to start chemotherapy or then start radiation therapy. And then those appointments would supersede our appointments. And then I would have to check on them if there was an issue with healing. And then they would circle back sometimes uh, nine months later, sometimes a year later. And at that point, we could see what other um, effects, you know, either treatment had had or if there had been no, you know, treatment, how the flaps had settled. And typically the upper pole is the problem. So whether it's a breast reconstruction, whether it's a explant procedure, um, many of these will have different areas that affect portions of the breast that then we have to use strategies and techniques to help offset the changes. So in a breast reconstruction, it's typically always gonna be the upper pole because the tissue reconstructions don't reconstruct the upper pole well, they just don't have enough volume. And then with the implants, when I started, all we had was round and uh, rounds really didn't reconstruct the upper pole that well. 
either. And then later we, we got shaped implants back. But going back to the tissue reconstructions, when we had those upper pole uh, hollows or deficits, we would use fat transfer. So fat transfers have been around 100 years, over 100 years, honestly. And so <laughs> the joke was back then uh, at our place, we needed to do a lot of fat harvest and we didn't have all the sophisticated equipment I have now. So we'd sterilize a Williams-Sonoma colander to strain the fat and then help get different particulate matter out of the fat. And then we would transfer it back in a syringe-based way using what's called a Coleman cannula. It was plastic surgeon who came up with uh, fat transfers for facial uh, surgery using a small uh, set of cannulas and that's how everybody started because that's what everybody had available. That's what you could use from a, a technical standpoint to execute those steps in the operation. Then later on, you, you could have different types of you know, liposuction. I would never advocate uh, using laser, uh, anything that overheats the fat. Um, that was not something I would do. Um, certainly you could use ultrasound assisted, you could use uh, anything, you know, that would not harm the fat, power assisted, uh, manual, uh, uh, adding more water with uh, hydro placements. Um, so the fat would get harvested, get processed and put back. So fat transfers were done routinely for those patients. You can imagine if I was doing those every week, multiple times a week, patients would need fat transfers all the time to help offset those changes, especially like I said, in the upper pole. So that was a really common thing. So I would do fat transfers, you know, 100, 150 times a year. So as we fast forward to doing, you know, say an X plant, here, an X plant could be the upper pole and the lower pole. Typically, the lower pole is a problem because the implants were placed behind the muscle. So we're doing fat transfers in those areas to help fill both upper pole, levage area, and then the lower pole. That helps offset many of the changes in the chest wall. All right.